Okay, so this is lecture 26 and up to this point I've been talking about rainfall and then we talked a great deal about evaporation and or, I'm sorry about infiltration and, and we talked a little bit about a about evapotranspiration, uh, but we're going to spend uh, the rest of this uh, series of, of lectures uh, in hydrology on sort of the rainfall runoff process itself. And so this is the introduction to that, kind of talking about a few things. And I want to talk uh, about drainage basins today. I want to get into storm hydrographs. And then specifically, and I'm going to give you another recording that uh, goes over uh, looking at the runoff volume in inches of equivalent rain. And so what we're talking about here is I've got a uh, Q versus time, which is my discharge hydrograph that comes, comes um, through here. And the volume underneath this is uh, a total volume of water that's, uh, that goes by. We can actually express that volume instead of like cubic feet or cubic meters, which is a traditional volumetric expression. We can actually express that in terms of equivalent amount of rainfall. And so we'll talk about that. If you look at a drainage basin, um, it's, uh, it's basically synonymous with the words watershed, drainage area, catchment, those are all used uh, kind of interchangeably. And if you look at this uh, 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 basically picture here, uh, you can see that we've got these um, streams that flow uh, through the system. And if I'm interested in this point right here as an outflow, I wanna know what part of this landscape contributes, if it were to rain, would contribute to this uh, location uh, where I'm, I'm standing at right here or where I'm monitoring, what, what uh, is the watershed? What is the drainage area that would contribute uh, as water comes out of the sky? Where would it, if, if it were raining hard enough and long enough, where would the contributing area be? And so you can see that we've got these high areas here where if water falls on this side of this uh, drainage divide, it runs off to my uh, into my area that is above this outlet point here I've shown in red. If the drop of water falls on the other side of that line, well, it runs off into another area, another watershed. And so when we talk about that, the topographic area where the drainage basin is that topographic Graphic area that collects and discharges surface stream flow from one out, from one outlet or the mouth, and so this is the outlet of this watershed. And again, if we were talking, you know, way on downstream from here, you know, it might be a, a series of number of streams that come together to form a larger watershed. But this is known as the drainage divide. That area that if water fell on this side, it goes this way. Water falls on this side, goes this way. That is the drainage divide. Now, there's a lot of different types of drainage patterns, and these are just some of the, and we're not going to get into this too detailed, but I think it's worth mentioning, you know, this is traditional what you would see in a, in a lot of areas of, of the uh, mid, Midwestern United States. You get this dendritic uh, kind of pattern. Sometimes you'll find a rectangular pattern. So they will call it the trellis pattern. And then you get this trellis on folded terrain. I'm not going to try to make you an expert in these. It's just be aware that as you get into uh, certain uh, areas of the country, um, these kind of these patterns do have an influence on the way water comes off the watershed in terms of how fast and how, and, and, and how quickly. Uh, this is an example uh, of this trellis pattern. Uh, here we've, you know, as I mentioned, we've got this dendritic pattern. This is the trellis pattern. Uh, this is a Washita range, which uh, I've talked about down in Arkansas. This was uh, in the lecture I gave where I talked, I think it's lecture 11, where I go over the slope area method for indirect discharge measurements. This is the area where um, uh, down in uh, uh, southwest Arkansas, uh, you know, southwest of Little Rock, south of uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas, you can see the drainage patterns here are more trellis than dendritic. And you've got these folded uh, hard rock and the soils are very tight. 
uh, very, very shallow. And you can see how the formation of the watershed is where it's, it's more of a trellis than this dendritic type of shape. Stream order is something that you'll hear mentioned. I'm not going to talk to you a great deal about that, but just to give you the concept here, when we talk about the order of a stream, the, the lowest order is the, the stream order one, which means this is high up in the watershed and there are no, um, you know, there's no major uh, streams that, there's no other streams that come together. When two first order streams come together, they form a second order stream. And so you can have a second order stream and it does not become a third order stream until another second order stream would enter in. We could have a, a you know, after the, this, at this point, it becomes a second order stream. If I got another first order stream that comes in here, it's still going to be a second order stream until it joins another second order stream. And then we've got a third order stream. You get two third order streams coming together. You got a fourth order stream. And again, it takes two fourth orders to come together to, to, to form a, a fifth order stream. And you can see that we've got a third order coming in here. It remains a four, got a one, it remains a four. So that's, that's when we talk about order of stream. And so when you get out onto the Missouri, the Mississippi River, uh, it's a very high number. I don't, you know, it depends on where you're at, but you've got a, a very high number uh, in terms of its stream order. So let's talk a, a little bit about definitions of streams. We've got perennial streams, which are uh, continuous flow. So those are, those are streams that flow year round and streams like the Gasconade, the Merrimack, uh, the Missouri River, the Mississippi River, those are all perennial streams. And they're at low, you know, like it's been very dry here lately, but we still got water coming out of, on the Little Piney and the Gasconade. That's fed by groundwater from springs and just seeps out of the ground. And those, those are perennial streams. If it's an intermittent stream, that's a stream that generally only has flow during the wet season. If it's a ephemeral stream, it generally has flow during and for a short time following a rainfall event. And then the stream flow hydrograph uh, is the relation of flow rate and time at a particular location in stream. And I've already kind of covered this, but this is what a stream flow hydrograph looks like. And, um, you know, when, when you look at these intermittent and ephemeral streams, they're fairly close in their definition. Uh, again, uh, this is a, another definition by Vin T. Chow uh, on uh, what a hydrograph is. It's an integral expression of the physiographic and climatic characteristics that get, govern the relation between rainfall and runoff of a particular drainage basin. And here we see uh, some idealized hydrographs here. Uh, again, we've got time plotted on the x-axis. We have discharge on the y. And we've got, uh, you've got stream flow that is traced here in black. And then we've dissected here the various components. This would be sort of the overland flow part. You have a, you know, some kind of rain event here that's projected on this hanging uh, bar graph at the top. That's a rainfall hydrograph there, um, as you recall from lectures 21 and 22. And then we've got some response to that rainfall and that's uh, due to saturated overland flow and then this thing called interflow, where that would be water that, you know, infiltrates and in just very shallow into the unsaturated zone and comes out lower on down the watershed, comes out in the stream. And then we get this thing we call base flow. And the base flow is basically, essentially the groundwater contribution. And you can see that uh, from this cross section of the stream where we've got the hill slope up here and you've got the, the, this ground surface here. And basically the water table is the groundwater and you could get the base flow that's intersecting with the stream and that's what's providing the stream flow. And so if you are looking for an observation of groundwater elevation and it hasn't rained for a long time, it's a, during a dry period, go out and look at your stream and in the immediate, immediate proximity of that stream, that's going to be the elevation of the groundwater there. Of course, it's going to increase as you go away, uh, up uh, uh, uphill slope away from the stream because gravity is what drives this flow uh, downward. Um, during the wet period, this is what I was talking about with the interflow. This is water that's above the water table, but it's getting in and moving through the system and coming out and then it becomes saturated overland flow. There's a lot of, of things that you can talk, that you can look at. And I encourage you to look at the references 
uh, in the lecture. It goes into more detail than I can in the lecture. Um, after uh, rainfall, you can see the areas that are uh, areas of seepage, uh, areas during the dry period where you get seepage. And this is if you're out, um, you know, in the spring of the season, you'll notice you'll be hiking along maybe on a trail and you'll, you know, you get into areas where it's really marshy, even up on a hillside. Those are areas where you've got seeps, where uh, water is disappearing uh, upstream, but it reappears as interflow and in and the form of a seep. So let's talk about runoff. Uh, it's defined by the variation of abstraction processes and spatial and temporal patterns of rainfall. So what does that mean? That means that as I have a watershed that I've defined and I look at the outflow at the end of that, the rainfall is not going to be always evenly distributed across the entire drainage area. And there's also going to be various, uh, uh, there's non-homogeneous factors that deal with abstraction and infiltration across that watershed. So when abstractions have been uh, satisfied, you know, we've got the initial abstraction from the, from the NRCS method and then we've got the storage. When those have been satisfied, overland flow begins. That's the excess uh, precipitation that we talk about where it starts to become runoff. And when the channel flow begins to occur, the channel hydraulics dominate the runoff characteristics from the watershed. So overland flow eventually moves into the drainage channels and becomes the channel flow. And there's a lot of uh, things that are controlling kind of the shape of that hydrograph on a particular watershed. And so the shape of that watershed is going to be due to, you know, basically the, the variations of, of the way the hill slopes are, the, the watershed itself, how it abstracts water, how it infiltrates water, and then what are the shape of the channels? How rough are they? How fast will they convey the water to the outlet? That all comes into play when we look at these hydrographs. All right, so if I look and uh, I, I want to look at the dominant basin characteristics that uh, control my, um, my response to, uh, to excess precipitation, I've got obviously the drainage area. Whoops. I've got the drainage area. I've got the slope of the drainage area and the slope of the channels. I've got hydraulic roughness, both in the, on the hill slopes as well as the main channel. I've got the natural and the channel storage that's possible there. If I've got, you know, depressions or I've got uh, maybe stormwater detention basins built in, maybe I've got just low areas that fill up during rainstorms. I got the stream length, I've got the channel density. You know, the higher your density of stream channels are, the faster that water is gonna come off. I've got antecedent moisture condition, which we've talked about when we talked about the curve number. And then I've got vegetation, channel modifications, and a number of other things. So if we look at the examples of effect of basin characteristics, if I've got a steep versus a mild slope to my watershed, here I've got a mild gentle slope and you can see here's a steeper slope and look at the difference in this rainfall, uh, I'm sorry, the, the runoff hydrograph from the difference in the slope of the channel. And you can see that the steeper slopes mean that water gets off faster and I get this same amount of volume of water under the hydrographs here, but it comes off quicker, faster, and uh, the water, the hydrograph goes back to zero or back to low flow uh, much quicker than it would if it were a much uh, lower slope. And so you get, uh, get that effect. If I've got runoff uh, that's uh, less rough, the hydraulic roughness versus more rough, you can see that I get a, a difference in the a watershed um, hydrograph. Uh, if I've got, uh, you know, lower roughness, it's very efficient in terms of the, the way the water gets conveyed. You can see it's got a higher peak and a shorter time to when it gets back to normal flow than it would be for uh, a rougher water, uh, you know, watershed runoff. And then if I've got little storage or versus more storage, if I've got, you know, ponds and, and dams in there, I'm going to really store some of that and release that water slowly. You can see that it knocks the the, the, the elevation of this peak down quite a bit and it draws out that hydrograph. And this is essentially what we do when we do uh, stormwater detention basin design because we've had an urbanized area. We wanna go in there and we wanna knock those peaks down to mimic the natural hydrology. And we can do that by storing water temporarily and then releasing it slowly. And that's what you can see here with these two comparisons of uh, storage, a uh, little storage versus more storage. And then when you've got a uh, high density amount of channels in there, you can see a high density has a higher peak 
than you do for a low density. It takes longer for the water to get off the watershed. And then, you know, how, how, how long is your watershed? What's the stream length? If it's shorter versus uh, longer here, uh, you can see that that has an influence as well. There's also characteristics of how the, the, the storms come across a watershed. And you can see here if I've got, uh, you know, most of my rainfall occurring at the front end of the uh, storm as opposed to the back end, look at the shape. There's the same amount of rain in both of these, but if I got the rain loaded up toward the front, you can see that I peak quicker and come back down, whereas here the, the majority of the rain is at the back end, so I get this uh, peak that occurs much later in the storm. The same thing if I have storm movement, if I've got, you know, a storm just going across part of the watershed, moving uh, storm A, moving um, from uh, basically from the upstream end of things to, uh, I'm sorry, downstream to upstream, I get a, a, a bigger difference than, I'm sorry, I've got this mixed up here. Sorry about that. If I've got my storm A on this one is occurring over a smaller part of my watershed as opposed to storm B, which is occurring over all of my watershed at the same time, you can see the differences there. There's less volume in storm A than storm B, and you've got, uh, you've got uh, a later peak in storm A because it takes a while to get from this area of the watershed down to here. You see this a lot out west where you get a mountainous area and, and then down in the, in the valley in the plain, say in Arizona, you can have rain, high uh, intensity rain happening way up in the mountains, and then it takes a long time, but there are times when flash floods will occur down low, people will be playing in those streams, all of a sudden they get in trouble because this wall of water comes washing through, that's from a storm that happened way up in the mountains, and it, it didn't occur till way later in the, uh, they didn't know, it wasn't raining where they're at, and so this is what you look at, that hydrograph. Now, uh, this is what I was talking about earlier and get a little confused on this graphic. If I have storm movement going from A to B, so it's going from downstream to upstream, this is what that looks like. I get an early peak, but then I don't have, uh, you know, I, I don't have it drawing out quite as far as if I'm going from B to A, I get this later peak and uh, well, they basically end about the same time, but the peak is, is much later and comes uh, in the water. Uh, it kind of builds to a higher peak because as the storm is moving this way. The flood wave of the water that's already been dropped on the watershed is also moving with it. All right, now let's, uh, so those are some kind of introductory uh, concepts about the way uh, watersheds work. Let's talk about expressing volume of runoff and equivalent rain in terms of inches or centimeters. And so I've got a hydrograph that I can compute the volume uh, in units of volume a uh, length cube there in terms of meters cubed, or maybe it's a cubic feet. Uh, sometimes we'll, instead of uh, expressing it cubic feet, that's a large number at times, we'll actually can express that in terms of acre feet, which basically that's volume. Acre is, a, is an area, feet is a depth. And so you can think of one acre foot being an acre in area uh, filled to a depth of one foot. So you'll see sometimes that will be expressed as a volume. But I want to take that volume that's underneath that hydrograph, and I can express that in terms of equivalent rent runoff if I take the volume and divide it by the value of the drainage area that that volume represents, or the, 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 the hydrograph is, is uh, drawing from. And so I've got this watershed here, and I get this hydrograph that at the outlet from a particular storm, I get the total volume here in terms of cubic feet. And if I divide that by the square feet of drainage area, I get this in terms of just feet. And that's feet of equivalent rainfall. And we're going to have an example problem, as I said, um, uh, to show you this concept in a little more detail. But uh, first of all, I want to show you uh, how to cal calculate the volume of the uh, of water that's under a hydrograph. So if this hydrograph is expressed in units of cubic feet per second, I basically can discretize that into little rectangles at each point that I've got a value for the, for the runoff. And if I take the time delta T that's, that's represented by that point, if I take the, the value of, of flow, which is in cubic feet per second, 
and I multiply delta times delta T, which that's in seconds, I end up getting cubic feet. And that would give you the volume in each one of those little values, or, uh, each one of those rectangles. If I go through and just sum that up over the length of the hydrograph, I get the total volume in uh, length cubed units. And so if you've got uh, uh, ex an example of that, or you've got a hydrograph, you would take the discrete value of the discharge on the hydrograph is summed and then multiplied by the time step to determine the volume of runoff. And so what do I mean by that? If I've got, let's go back here and let's use the eraser. If I can up, erase that. And I'm just going to put a few points here. And let's say that I've got time and flow rate. And let's just say that this hydrograph was represented by five values. So at zero, at one hour in, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. And so then I had flow of zero, let's say 100, just make this easy, 200, 300, uh, 200, zero. So basically I had these flow values on this hydrograph and there's five of them. I have the choice. I can say, okay, uh, the volume is equal to sum. I is equal to one to five of my QI times delta T. Now, if you do that, delta T is a constant. You can pull that through and just say that that's the sum. I is equal to one to five of the QI. And so then all I need to do is sum up my discharge values. That's what this does. So 100, 200, 300, 200, that ends up being what? Three, six, 800, all right? Delta T is one hour, okay? And so we're gonna put that as 3,600 seconds, okay? And my sum of the Qs is 800 cubic feet per second. If I multiply 3,600 by 800, that would give me the volume underneath that hydrograph in cubic feet. And we're going to have an example uh, to work in class, and there will be an example uh, that you can see online. Um, and, but that, uh, that concludes this lecture.